Before we launch into things, uh, I want to set the stage with the challenge. Um, as Brett mentioned, this is a, a, a challenging um, obstacle and a challenging milestone for businesses to achieve and overcome, but it's a really interesting subject matter to dive into. And so setting the table, what makes this so hard for entrepreneurs and for the small business and, and uh, startup founders out there that are joining us today? First thing, it's competitive. There's a small pool of capital uh, out in the market that all of the smart people on the call here are uh, part of the webinar here today are competing for, are competing with, uh, you know, the likes of uh, the good lawyers of the world and the other startups across Canada. Mm -hmm. There's a, a pool of investors and they're all looking to uh, invest in the best company. So it's competitive right from the beginning. Um, one nice thing I would say though, so, uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, investment capital around these days and a lot, especially attracted to sort of the startup and technology world. So that is a wind of change blowing in our favor, I would say. Definitely. And, you know, in Canada, there's more investment globally. There's way more investment than ever before. And I know as a startup founder and, you know, in, in the early days of Good Lawyer, how hard it can be to find investors that believe in your mission and your dream and then convince them to write you checks. So it, it is a long process. And again, I'm going to chime in probably more than Josh will like with some of my, you know, experiences just from going through it for the last few years and some of the different milestones that we've hit. But at the end of the day, raising money is about persevering. And, um, you know, there's so many stories out there of entrepreneurs talking to hundred, 200 investors, before they got their first check, before they got their lead and were really able to kickstart their business. So um, it's a long process, folks. We wanna make it easier on the legal front so you don't have to worry about that, um, but just be prepared to persevere and keep telling that story. And one of the things I'm gonna definitely mention again is planting those seeds early and always. Yeah. So uh, back to you, big guy. Yeah, awesome. So uh, a couple of the other challenges here, and we won't spend a ton of time on these because we'll jump into the substance and we'll, we'll come back to these. But uh, the next key piece that I want to flag here, and this is uh, really from the technical and legal compliance perspective, when you're raising money, there are all kinds of rules that dictate how you can do it, what you're allowed to sell and who you're allowed to raise money from. And so there are uh, complex rules that you have to follow. And there are consequences if you mess it up and you don't follow those rules. So that's another element here that creates challenge in the process. Um, something that you know we've felt here uh, at various times in our own fundraising journey is number three, this sort of distracting and time consuming aspect of raising capital. It takes you out of your core day to day building the business. It's necessary, um, but sort of managing and balancing those two things is something that we felt. Absolutely. And, you know, there's in the early days, especially, but kind of always the, the founder's time in a startup is so critical and there's always more things to do than you can possibly fit into a day. Um, and rest assured that gets more exacerbated over time. Um, so you got to be smart, you got to be calculated and you got to be efficient when it comes to raising money. And you can't be that founder that just departs and takes off for six, nine months on the fundraising trail and leaving your team to kind of pick up all the pieces. You got to lead and, and drive your business forward first and foremost. So again, that's part of what we're trying to do today is help you from the legal side, which is a critical piece to fundraising, expedite that journey. And, you know, so you can focus back on what's most important and that's building your business. Yeah. So you can be in two places at once. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the last one here, uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to hit on this throughout the, throughout the journey here. Uh, it can be emotional. You're, you're going to hear some no's along the way. Um, even, you know, even the, the biggest, uh, most sort of blue chip tech companies that exist in, in our world now heard no's along their journey. So, uh, rest assured, uh, you'll be no different and don't be discouraged. We've heard no's and I'm sure we will continue to along our journey. Uh, it's part of the process. If your idea was so obvious, uh, it would likely already exist. So if it was really obvious to say yes, um, you know, it would be out there. Uh, 
Wow. I mean, it does feel obvious that there would be an online way to hire fast, <laughs> affordable legal help. And yet here we are. We exist. Yeah. No, folks, it, again, it, I, I just want to stress that one more time and I'll shut up. It is an emotional roller coaster ride. You're going to feel highs. You're going to feel a lot of lows when you when you hear no's from investors and you're going to hear a lot of them. You need a thick skin. And I'll just go back to that that word perseverance. Uh, building a startup is the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. And if you're not willing to persevere and find people that can persevere with you, um, it's going to be a really long journey for you. We're in it for the long haul, brother. Yes, we are. Okay, today's mission, we always like to give a mission uh, in our webinars to sort of let you know where we're going, what the roadmap looks like. The mission, we want to help you understand kind of the fundamentals of capital raising for early stage companies. Uh, how we get there, we're going to talk about the factors that you might consider when you're deciding whether you want to raise or whether raising capital makes sense for your business. Uh, we're going to help you think through how you prepare for those early stage fundraising rounds. And then uh, we're going to lean on Brett and some of his sort of practical tips and experience uh, for to kind of wrap up our discussion here today, which is really about um, what can you do to actually close fast, efficiently, and get back to your core business? Starts by planting seeds, folks, early and often. So uh, to set the stage, I uh, want to spend just a little bit of time here uh, sharing what our story and our journey has looked like here today. So, uh, Brett, I think I'll let you speak to this. Maybe I'll play color guy on, on this slide. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, so, you know, we're not here showcasing how you know you're going to raise your series a because that's not what today's all about today is about how do you raise those early financing rounds to kick start your startup and get it off the ground and you know we've been able to do that so this is our journey it started off by you know i was working at the corporate law firm uh a decent salary still felt a little bit like well-paid slavery but um good enough salary that i could put a chunk of change into a business to kick things off along with a co-founder. So we invested the first 25,000. That number was really to be eligible for that AITC, which is an investor tax credit, really useful, not in Alberta anymore because they took it away, but in Ontario, BC, and most of the provinces, the prairies for sure, um, they have this investor tax credit and it can be a fantastic sweetener in those really early days when you're looking from for an investment from folks in that same province who you know maybe you know through your network or what have you so um initial money initial investment coming from the founders the next level was leaning on that network friends and family and you know mostly friends and people that were friends or connected with folks on the team that's where we got that friends and family capital from and that really was again planting seeds incredibly early and proving a little bit that at that at that stage in the game for us we had an mvp we had some customers but we had not worked out the majority of the kinks so it was really early days the valuation was lower and it was about people buying into the team and the dream so that was that 450 friends and family and then uh we just ended up closing uh our pre-seed round of a million bucks and again, leaning heavily on that network, but starting to expand it beyond folks that, you know, I knew or Josh knew for the past decade and moving into some angel territory with folks who we haven't known as much long, as, as long are definitely accredited investors and bring a higher level of sophistication and nitpicking when, you know, you're going through the investor deck, you're having to answer questions that you never had to answer before. When they're looking at your cap table, your you know corporate structure, these guys are and these gals are looking into details that you probably got away with in those earlier rounds. Yeah. So that is really where having a fantastic legal support in place and having good financials in place is going to take you a lot further, especially if you're dealing with those angels. Yeah, such a good point. So the level of sophistication of uh questions and challenges and uh, disclosure um, and records that we had to provide through this process ratcheted up with every step and i think we were in a very good position this summer to move through this pre-seed round and to deal with the angel investors uh, 
in a streamlined and fairly efficient way because we had a good foundation. And that's, you know, one of the byproducts of a couple of lawyers stepping out and building a company and understanding from the beginning how important it was to have the right structure in place, the right foundation in place, keeping the right records in place so that when it came to dealing with uh, a more sophisticated investor that asked, you know, predictable questions, you know, from someone who is used to placing early stage investments, we had the answers readily accessible. And uh, we're going to dive into what that looks like in a bit more detail here. Yeah, folks. And two just like quick comments there on your legal stuff. Again, it's one of those kind of shot showstoppers, you know, deal breakers. You got to have that stuff tight or these investors are never writing you a check. On the more iterative piece, when you're thinking about your pitch deck, it think of it as a living document. And when you leave an investor pitch or you, you know, you leave a conversation and you know, you were walking them through what you had and these questions pop popped up that you didn't have good answers to go back internal, find them and update that deck. It's a living document and it should be getting better every single time you talk to a new investor. And, you know, we try to do that. We don't always do it because there's a million things going on, but that's the way that I view pitch decks and investor materials is, you constantly are iterating them just like your business to make them better, improve them based on the learnings. Yeah. So uh, step one here on our, today's mission is really helping understand whether as a starting place, this presentation is the right presentation for you and for the business that you're building. And, you know, put it up in the byline here. Not all business ideas are suitable for investment capital. Um, some business ideas are maybe more suitable for traditional uh, bank financing, lending, that type of operation. What we're talking about here, the right type of business that's suitable to seek investment capital is a business idea that can actually return, um, can provide a, a multiple of return on investment. So uh, think of the idea of basically, can you grow so that if somebody gives you a hundred grand today, a year from now, you can give them a, a, a return, a significant lift or a year, 10 years, five years, whatever it may be, down the road, you can grow your business so that initial investor can have a, a lift on the, the money that they gave you in the first place. Yeah, Josh hit that, that word that I was thinking of twice, growth. Investment is intended to grow your business faster than that investor could grow their investment in another uh, company or asset. So it's got to be growth oriented and it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be the next Uber, but you need to have a material growth trajectory to make the investment interesting. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Now, that's a great point. So investment capital is not about uh, the capital that you need to just run your operations as they are today. Uh, it's money that you use so that a year from now, your business looks different. It's bigger, it's better, it's bolder, it's taking on new challenges. Uh, the next piece here that I want to spend some time talking about is sort of who can you raise money from and who should you be raising money from? Mm -hmm. This is a uh, securities compliance rule-based uh, legal piece. Full stop. That's what we're talking about. So uh, if I'm zooming out and I'm putting my securities lawyer hat back on, what I want you to understand as an entrepreneur or a business owner here is that uh, there is a whole umbrella world of law in Canada, um, which says businesses uh, need to be really careful when they're raising money. And this body of law, you can think of uh, as balancing two interests. On one side, it's, it's trying to balance the interests of making investment capital available to entrepreneurs so their businesses can grow. And on the other side, it's balancing this interest of protecting investors from uh, essentially being duped. So it's consumer protection legislation on one side, and it's about opening up accessibility to capital markets on the other side. Mm -hmm. That balance uh, sometimes tilts more in favor of consumer protection, other cases more in favor of raising capital for business. So that is the world that you're a part of whenever you're raising capital, whenever you're taking an investment money in your business, you need to be very aware that you need to comply with this uh, consumer protection law. And as a 
sort of foundational understanding here. Consumer protection laws, securities laws say, as a early stage startup, early stage business, you can only raise money from the friends and family and direct close business associates of the founders, of the directors and officers of that business, from your employees, and from a special category of investor that we have determined doesn't need the same level of consumer protection because they're so wealthy. And we call that category accredited investors. So friends, family, directly connected to founders, executives of the business, close business associates that know you really well, and very wealthy people, angels, accredited investors in the, in the public. Last piece here, what are you actually selling? Uh, really important piece. When you're taking investment capital, you are selling an ownership stake in your business. So that means you are giving away um, a slice of your pie. So if you have 100% of the pie, uh, let's say shared between Brett and I in, in this example, we each have 50-50. As soon as we start bringing in investors, we're carving off and reducing our respective size of the pie and issuing a piece of that pie to the new investor. So really important to understand you're giving away equity, uh, you're giving away some of your um, ownership stake and economic interest in the business when you bring investors in. Uh, you're issuing a security. In most cases, we're talking about issuing uh, some sort of common share in your business. Absolutely. And, you know, again, having some trusted partners along with you for the ride can help flesh out what is market or what is reasonable in the circumstances, you know, given where you're at as a company and what the opportunity looks like down the road, as well as again, how much is that investor in bringing to the table, both in terms of cash and extras, whether it's network expertise, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Just to, quickly, cause I, I want to encourage folks to be dropping questions in the Q and A. I'm going to try to answer them, get to them as, as we go through here, not all at the end. Um, Sean, with the AITC gone, has Alberta replaced it in any way? Unfortunately, not yet. And uh, that was a point of discussion that I actually brought up at the Good Lawyer Summit with Minister Schweitzer, because it does put us uh, in Alberta at a disadvantage relative to some of these other provinces. I know in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, there's a 45% tax credit. I believe in Ontario and BC, it's 30 still. Um, and that is a great carrot for investors to put money into your company and get a very significant tax credit back. So um, Minister Schweitzer, if you're watching, please bring it back. I'm uh, sure he is. He's a fan. Yeah. And then Hamid, quick one here. As founders, did you receive salary in stages one and two? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Been living on scraps and savings for a really long time. And frankly, we had the cash where I could have paid myself, but I didn't because part of the good lawyer journey and being part of the good lawyer team for virtually everybody on it is taking a pay cut from what they could be making in the market. And, you know, we've got another great webinar. I might be next week. I'm not sure Katie um, on using stock options as a supplement to that reduced cash salary and, a, you know, finding alignment with early founders as well as those early employees that are so critical to success. So um that's a really good question. I'll just chime in on that if you don't mind, because Please. we're going to talk about it and I'll, I'll just uh, move ahead slightly here, but we're going to talk about it in the coming slides here, this idea of um, thinking like the investor. And one thing that investors will expect of you when they're um, investing in your business to help you grow, they want you to demonstrate that you are a responsible steward of their capital, of the cash that they're giving you. And that's, you know, as Brett has described, uh, a huge sacrifice that he's made personally to be a responsible steward of good lawyers capital and of the investment capital that we're bringing in is that he's essentially lived on scraps for a very long time. <laughs> ramen, baby. Ramen. Yeah. Lots of itchy band going down here at the good lawyer office. Yeah. Uh, okay. Rock and roll. Yeah. Let's rock and roll. All right. So the next slide I have up here is just really about kind of a, an overview and roadmap slide here. And I've catered this to the startup founders in the audience, uh, this is what I would describe as sort of the traditional uh, early stage to sort of medium stage uh, fundraising 
journey that a, a startup could expect to follow. So, um, you know, we shared the good lawyer story and we're still very firmly um, slotted in at stage two of this process. So, you know, the founders came together, helped to bootstrap from there, reaching out to friends and family, some business associates in your network that know you, believe in you, believe in your dream and your vision for what you're trying to build. Uh, you've demonstrated that maybe you've built a, you know, a, a functioning product, an MVP that you can show them, and this is how it's going to grow and develop from here. Uh, from there, we talked about how we've branched out now to um, some angels. And frankly, because of some of the progress that we've made, uh, we've actually had the angels come and approach us because, you know, we've sort of demonstrated some credibility and some traction and some uh, uh, success in what we've built to date. Um, so that's sort of steps one and two, founder, friends, family, angels, that's sort of in that uh, pre-seed and, and seed stage. Um, beyond there, we're moving into, again, that seed and series A, B, C down the line. What we're talking about in those stages is working with uh, far more sophisticated investment uh, professionals. If we're talking about uh, venture capital uh, funds and institutional investors whose whole role in the economy, their whole job, their whole business model is making investments in businesses like yours. Um, because it is their business, because that's how they sort of uh, pay their employees and grow, they are extremely picky and sophisticated and will ask much more challenging questions and have a much higher expectation of sophistication from you as the business owner, as the founder, from us as the business than you would expect in stages one and two. So what I'm gonna to try to encourage here in the next slides is to start getting sophisticated early in the process, knowing that this is ultimately your roadmap. And as I discussed at the outset, there's lots of challenges and bogeys all along the way. Uh, and really because it, the expectation of sophistication ratchets up as you go, the earlier you sort of get on side and start um, putting the amount of rigor and attention and seriousness into this process, the better. Absolutely. And, you know, raising money is so much about storytelling and Josh is going to dig into, you know, some of the legal pieces that should not be a major roadblock for you. And if you're finding that they are, then, you know, that's why we're here because they shouldn't be. There's so many difficult aspects to raising money that as a founder getting hung up on the legalities of around is the worst way you can be spending your time. You have to figure out how you can tell the story. And again, going back to that seed planting early idea, the reason why planting seeds early is so important is because if you show up to a brand new investor who you've never met before, you know, you bumped into it and then that's how you got the meeting. They don't know you and they're going to look at your track record. And if you have, you know, exits, that's going to help a lot. We did not have that benefit. So, you know, we started from the ground and had to work our way up. Um, but planting those seeds early and then talking to that investor again in three months, in six months, in a year, and them getting to see the progress you've made and the determination you have to chase this mission is so critical. So trying to get in front of as many people as you can in the community. You know, I saw a question in the chat, where do I find angels and VCs? You find them at startup events. You find them, you know, in the chat today, I guarantee you there are some investors in there. You got to put yourself out there and get into the mix and plant as many seeds as you possibly can, because you never know which one's going to grow into that lead investor that you need to, to kick things off. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about how you prepare the legal stuff here to get ready to, uh, to raise capital from your friends, from your family, from angels, from business associates in your network. Uh, the first piece here is about organizing for growth and a couple of things that I want to hit off right off the bat. If you're not incorporated, you have to be incorporated. Simple as that. There is one industry standard for building a business and raising capital and going through this growth trajectory that I talked about, and it is a corporation. So that is the basic building block for getting organized have to start there. you got to get incorporated. There is no other vehicle or entity in Canada that makes sense. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it on our website, that's why we built the Good Start Bundle. Early stage entrepreneurs need to get incorporated. 
need to have that, you know, on demand legal guidance in those important early days, because it is so critical and it's foundational. And if you don't do it at the beginning, you might lose a deal, an investment opportunity, and then you have to go back and do it more expensively later on anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Another key piece that I think goes into this organizing for growth and getting the structure right in the, in the first place. Uh, if you're building a business with co-founders, which I'm sure many of you are because it's you know incredibly difficult to build you know a big, hairy, audacious startup dream all alone to have all of those skills, uh, you need to have a shareholder agreement in place. You need to have a founder agreement in place that is going to basically um, help you and your co-founders understand your respective roles and responsibilities for building the business, for building the startup, but also really crucially um, is dealing with potential contingency planning for a founder exit. And I know it's kind of a downer topic to talk about when we're in this more exciting forward looking idea of uh, building, growing, bringing on investment. But this is a, a major risk that can kill startups and can kill investment is if you have not dealt with uh, appropriately how to uh, contingency plan around a founder exit. So I'll sketch out an example. It's probably the easiest way. Again, Brett and I own 50, 50% of a company and we have this great startup dream that we want to build together and we build it for a year. And at the end of one year, we've got a little bit of traction, but not enough for my liking. And I say, you know what, Brett, I'm going to leave. I'm going back to whatever my day job was before. If we haven't planned for that, I'm leaving this business that we've each helped build for one year. And I'm taking with me 50% of the ownership piece. You feel like running that business anymore? Zero chance. So that's the risk, right? I leave, I take 50% of the ownership piece, 50% of the future upside of this business. This business will die. So the contingency plan is basically some sort of prearranged uh, planning that we've made that sits in our founder agreement or sits in our shareholder agreement, which says, if one of us leaves, in this case, I've left, I have to give back a portion or all. You can get very customized and creative in how you do that of my equity ownership. So let's say we've decided, you know, one year is, it's not nothing. So I get to keep 5% and now the rest goes to Brett. Brett owns 95% of the company. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that's a fair outcome because you played a role in kicking, getting things off the ground, but I'm going to drive it forward. And at 95%, I'm still very motivated to do that. At 50%, I'm not because it's horribly unfair. Yeah. So, and, and one thing I'll add folks is, you know, Josh is telling kind of a hypothetical story, but it's actually true. And that was literally our story. And, you know, fortunately we were able to work that situation out such that my first co-founder has a, a little piece of the pie that I can live with because he was hugely valuable in those early days, but not so much of the pie that I was dismotivated, like unmotivated to push this business along. And had we not mapped out some of those contingency plans in the early days. And, you know, fortunately for us, we were coming at this business with a legal background. So we were able to set a lot of that up in those early days. Um, good lawyer would not be here. So, and it's not just me, like I've had so many calls with founders dealing with this exact issue who want to talk to me because it's the trickiest issue that you can run into in those early days is dead weight on the cap table. A founder doesn't believe it anymore they leave. And if you don't have that kind of business prenup contingency plan set up from the start through a founder agreement or something similar, then you're going to be in big trouble and your baby might die. Yeah. So just to quickly summarize, there's three key pieces at the organization stays, especially if you have co-founders that you're building your business with, get incorporated, get a shareholder agreement in place that deals with this contingency piece. And then the other thing that you need is some sort of uh, founder key employee agreements, which ties in again to that contingency planning. Uh, as Brett mentioned, that's all a part of our, uh, of our startup oriented uh, bundle. The next thing I want to talk about is in the preparation phase is sort of putting yourself uh, in the investor's shoes and getting ready to answer tough questions. And from a legal perspective, some of the tough questions that jump out to me right off the bat uh, are things around sort of where your business is deriving value from 
And have you protected that value um, through legal mechanisms? So there's two examples that I'll give you. First is a commercial relationship. If I'm helping to, uh, let's say, build a software solution that's going to solve something in a particular industry or a particular customer segment, one of the um, key legal questions or legal things that I can do to uh, prepare for a tough question is if I have a commercial agreement already in place with one of my current or future prospective customers where they've said, uh, yeah, I agree to buy your product, or I agree that if you build this product, that I will purchase it from you down the road. That's one way where you can sort of use a contract, use a commercial agreement to protect the value of your business and what you're building to answer a tough question that you might expect from an investor. A second one uh, that you know, might be relevant to some people in the, in the audience as well today is around protecting value in your intellectual property. So your intellectual property will include things like your brand. You know, the Good Lawyer brand is part of our intellectual property. And we've protected that by filing trademarks, registered trademarks. Uh, for your business, it might be brand. Maybe you've got a fantastic brand that you're building that you can prepare to answer the tough question by saying, yeah, we've protected that value by registering a trademark. The other way you might do it is maybe you have a software invention or a mechanical invention or a biochemical formula. Maybe you're making some health oriented product or wellness oriented product. You can protect that value and ensure that that value um, stays in your business and can gr and promote growth in your business by registering and applying for patent protection. And investors are going to ask about whether you've taken steps to protect the value driving aspect of your business. And you can do that through those two legal mechanisms that I sketched out. Nothing to add. Oh, that was clean. Rarely is there nothing to add. I feel, I feel good. Uh, streamlining the legal process. Uh, steps one and two feed into step three. If you've organized for growth, if you've taken the steps to protect that commercial value, that upside value in your business and what you're growing, either through commercial contracts or through uh, intellectual property protections, or it might be through something, this occurred to me, locking down uh, a key employee. Maybe part of your secret sauce is the talent. Having those people um, invested for the long term in your business is another way that you can demonstrate how you've protected value. Wow. And I've done that exact thing, highlighting the team, um, where they came from and, and, you know, how bought into this mission they are, uh, has been key to the, the good lawyer story on the investment front. Yeah, no question. So if you've taken care of all of those three pieces, they can streamline and feed into, you know, step three here of making that legal process, uh, smoother and faster for actually, uh, raising capital. But there's another whole piece, which is sort of the securities law compliance piece. Uh, part of that is getting the number one and two uh, readily available so that you can answer those questions and you can demonstrate proof of that. Uh, also, it's about having your subscription agreement and the risk acknowledgement documents that you need to collect from your investors drafted, ready to go and organized in a streamlined fashion. Um, that's where the experience of a lawyer, of a, a, a specialized lawyer that has seen some investment rounds like myself or somebody that's a part of the Good Lawyer Network that has worked with startups, that has worked with raising capital, they can really help streamline that piece for you. Okay, Brett. We're kind of moving into now sort of step three in our mission, which is really about some of the, um, let's call it, more practical and more operational tips and tricks and experiences that we've had that I think some of you might um, find are valuable for your own journey in helping to sort of uh, close your round, get that money in, in an efficient, uh, efficient way. So we've talked a little bit about uh, this idea of protecting yourself, of sort of protecting yourself with a contingency plan on a founder exit. We also, I think as founders need to be aware that uh, we need to protect ourselves from the consequences of failing to comply with securities laws. As I mentioned at the outset, if you don't 
uh, follow all of the consumer protection rules that exist in securities laws, there are consequences. And in some cases, those consequences are not just the business's consequences. They can actually jump over uh, that barrier and become the consequences and the liabilities of the directors and officers of the business. So understanding that compliance piece, really, really important so that you can protect your own interests as the founder, as the driving force behind building the business. Yeah. And again, folks, from my perspective, and you know, I was a corporate lawyer for four plus years, but I focused on bank financing and regulatory stuff in the, in the banking world. So that means that I did not do this type of fundraising. I was not drafting these types of agreements and, you know, organizing cap tables. And so for me, even with the corporate law expertise, I would be, you know, fish out of water when it came to putting together these types of packages. And I think it would be crazy for a founder to try and do this type of corporate legal work on their own. You need a partner that you can trust, that you can outsource the legal piece of the fundraising process, because, you know, as this slide highlights and you got to tweak it here, you got to focus on telling that story and getting buy-in from investors and folks on your team who can help you tell that story, because it is hard to tell the right story that resonates and it's going to take practice and you don't want to be distracted because you're looking at contracts and, you know, worrying about securities regulations. And uh, that book always scared me. It scared me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it, it scared me, and you know, I, I think it's right to have a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of respect and fear for that thing because it's a long list of rules, and you can follow the ones that you know about. But the scary thing is the ones that you maybe don't know about that uh, you might be uh, you might be stepping outside of. The next piece here, I talked uh, on the previous slides here about the importance of getting organized, the importance of having the legal. Uh, documents in place to protect the value in your business. Uh, another really interesting piece, and Brett, I'm going to poke you on this, but I'll, I'll give you a prompt so you know what I'm talking about, is um, uh, something that we did here, and you know, we kind of mentioned the FOMO here. You can get organized uh, in a practical way to stimulate uh, more investment to have it coming in faster. And one way that we organized to do that was by actually um, having committed capital from people within our network before we started going out more broadly and saying, oh yeah, we actually are in the middle now of a pre-seed raise. We, mm-hmm. we found that investment and we were organized around finding that investment before we went out to the market. Yeah. I, again, when it comes to the legal stuff, there's a couple options, but fairly cut and dry. It needs to be in order or it's going to be a deal breaker with investors. When it comes to the the story and the FOMO that Josh mentioned, it's kind of like, there's no rules. And, you know, a lot of time you might hear a startup has opened its round and, you know, it's open for three months and then it closes. But the reality is, is if the founder isn't totally flying high and getting insane amounts of inbound interest from investors, it's just an arbitrary timeline that you've given yourself and, You've put yourself on the back foot if you don't have committed capital before you kind of announce that opening of the round, because you will ultimately announce that you have a round open. Yeah, we've got some committed capital. We're looking for this much more. But having that base of invested capital when you open up the rest of the round, from my perspective and from my experience, was so critical. And that can look like one big check from a lead investor. That can look like a syndicate of smaller checks from a number of people really close to your network, but going out to the broader market and starting to talk to some of these more sophisticated guys, when you already have some committed capital is absolutely key. And again, everything's about perception when it comes to raising money in this environment, being startup land. So putting yourself in the best position, keeping, you know, we're thinking about raising money, uh, you know, being vague, a little vague about it. We're thinking about raising money while you're actively trying to build that little initial pot to kick up, kickstart the round is the approach that we took. And, you know, we were able to succeed, I think largely because um, having that initial capital from the folks that are really into it, and then you're trying to fill the rest just provides more credibility. It's another point 
of trust that those investors who don't know you as well, who, you, you know, maybe you planted the seed a few weeks ago instead of a few years ago, having those other investors on board is going to give them more confidence. And so don't hamstring yourself by opening an empty round would nice. be my kind of point. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, last one here, just a, a quick teaser. We will get into this, but just this idea of, you know, pro founders can raise more cost effectively. And how do you become a pro? Well, you're getting reps, you're, you're out there in the world, you're meeting investors and you're, you're telling your story, but also you're engaging uh, the right type of help, the right type of strategic advisory services to help you through this and the right advisors that you need when you're raising capital uh, from a legal perspective is somebody that knows startups or somebody that knows the capital raising process. That's going to make you the pro and help you get through this. Do not go and raise money with the lawyer that did your real estate deal. Like maybe they're an expert uh, startup lawyer as well, but you want to have someone, as Josh said, that's done it before and can help you move through that process quickly. Yeah. All right. So uh, mission accomplished, hopefully quick recap here, and then we're going to get into uh, today's offer and Q and a. So um, step one, we are talking about the questions that you're asking yourself uh, when you're making the determination or the decision to raise capital, you know, uh, what do I need the capital for? Am I a growth oriented business? Um, who can I raise money from? Who in my network fits within those buckets that we talked about of friends, family, close business associates, and then the very wealthy accredited investors? And then what type of security am I actually selling? Remember, you're selling a long-term ownership interest in your business. You're likely selling a common share interest at these early stages of investment rounds. From there, we talked about the steps and things that you might think about to get organized to grow, right? So, you know, whether you're... Um, sole founder, co-founders, you need to get incorporated. You need to get the right structure in place. Um, the next thing we're kind of putting our, ourselves in the shoes of our investors. And we're thinking about some of the hard questions that they might ask. I can't predict all of the hard questions that investors are going to ask that are related to your business, but I do know, and I've, you know, I've represented investors in the context of these investments where we want to ask the basic legal questions around, do you have a contingency plan for a founder exit? Uh, do you have all of your early stage uh, founder share issuances documented? Have you used some sort of legal mechanism to protect the value in your business? And understanding the value of your business and then the right legal mechanism is important there, right? So if the value is your people, do you have them locked down with employment agreements? Do you have them properly incentivized with some sort of equity um, ownership stake in the business. If your value in your business is IP, have you protected your IP in some sort of way? If the value in your business is this customer contract, do you have some sort of signed uh, contract or relationship in place where you know you can monetize that down the road? Last couple of pieces here, um, you know, having the right investor as Brett or pardon me, the right advisor, as Brett um, emphasized there, is really, really important. Uh, it's not a family law lawyer that dabbles in corporate stuff that is going to be the right person to help you out with. Um, we have these security specialists. We have these uh, lawyers, corporate lawyers that are part of our network that have been through this process of raising capital at early stage investment rounds that can help be a really valuable guide, not only from the compliance piece, but also from the practical side of things. They've heard the questions and responded to the questions from the investors and can help you along the way. Yeah. You want a lawyer that bleeds startups and not just from the expertise and the competency standpoint, but just like the empathy side as well, just understanding what you're going through and being, you know, a support and not just another scary person that you have to deal with, you know, more often than you'd like. So finding the right partners is, is so key yeah. because it's going to be a tough journey and being able to go through it with folks that, you know, can expedite your learning and also, you know, lower your blood pressure is uh, invaluable. Last piece, Brett and I can give you some tips and tricks here, but at the end of the day, you are the driving force. You are the person that's going to make this happen for your business and make the dreams come true. So stay at it, keep working hard, keep learning uh, the bits of your story that resonate, the parts of your dream that resonate with your investors. 
and uh, know that Good Lawyer is here to help support you as you move along and good luck to you. So moving in here, if you're ready to start raising capital, we're gonna sketch out sort of what the, the options are that are available to you. So you have on one side of the, of the market, you have the traditional legal market, which is where Brett and I originally came from, which is billable hours through a traditional law firm. We grew up with law firm Larry and we know him very well. On the alternative, you have something that we're building here at Good Lawyer, which I think is a friendlier, more accessible, transparent way to move through the process. Billable hours in the traditional model basically means you call up me and my former role sitting in the big law firm, and I start my timer and we talk about your business and I learn about your goals and that's great. And I understand that you wanna raise money. And the whole time my timer is running, which means your bill is running. And I'm happy to uh, go above and beyond to help you talk to investors and to document and get all of the right paper in place. And at the end of the day, we'll close the deal, but you are going to give me a significant amount of that money that you just did all of that hard work to raise from those investors is going to come to me to pay for my legal bill. But so, don't worry, we're going to send you that 20 page invoice with each each line item. Yeah. So that's the traditional model. Um, what that ultimate invoice is going to look like is hugely variable. We know it's going to be a lot, but it's hugely variable, all depending on the amount of time that I spend working on your file. The Good Lawyer Grace model, what we built here, something totally different. What we're trying to do is to offer these services on a fixed fee and transparent basis. So the way that we manage a fundraising engagement is basically to take you into the Good Lawyer Network and start off by helping you find the right lawyer, the lawyer that has the startup expertise or the lawyer that has the fundraising and corporate law expertise to move through each of these steps with you on a transparent fixed fee basis. So what that means is before any engagement kicks off, that lawyer will spend time scoping it, understanding your needs and what you're looking for, and then create a fixed fee, fixed price mandate around delivering those services. So if it's an early stage investment round, they're gonna say, entrepreneur, in order to get this done, it's going to cost X. And you know you have that certainty moving into it. No surprise legal bills. Yeah, and I just dropped my LinkedIn, I think for the second time into the chat. Uh, if you're a founder and you're thinking about a friend's family angel round in the new year, add me to LinkedIn or drop me a note and uh, we wanna loop you in because we're gonna be rolling out a very exciting new product early new year based on this exact problem that we're seeing with so many founders trying to get an affordable solution to raise that initial round, you know, 100 grand, 200 grand, not the big ones and where, you know, the legal fees start to matter less if you're in the series A world, but where paying a law firm 20 grand is like, you know, it, it, it hurts when you're raising 150 from your network. So if you're interested in that, hit me up on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if, if you've listened to the presentation today and you think, well, not only do I need help raising capital, but I need help with all those other steps leading up to it, which means getting organized, uh, getting the founder contingency plan in place, protecting your value, whether through contracts, IP registrations, or employment agreements, then fundamentally the best way to move through that within the Good Lawyer Network is to become a Good Lawyer Pro. And what that means is you're going to get a significant discount on the service fees that Good Lawyer uh, um, charges for each of those specific mandates. You're gonna get access to our entire network of lawyers so that you can call them and you can speak to them for no charge. And you can start understanding and asking these questions to understand uh, your roadmap and how you're nav going to navigate towards uh, capital raising. And you're also gonna get sort of the, uh, the full attention and, and experience here of our customer support team to help you sort of find those right people and make those right connections and sketch that roadmap. As Brett mentioned, the offer, because you've invested an hour of time hanging out with us and learning about um, this roadmap and getting educated to help understand the value of all of that the legal services and tools can play in helping you through this roadmap, we like to say thank you by offering a su substantial discount on our pro offering as Brett mentioned, it's the last time we're making it available here in last 2020. One of the year. Um, so check it out. Like I said, if that process of maturing to getting ready to raise 
friends and family money resonates with you, this is just simply the best way to do it in the marketplace. Just like there are good lawyers and bad lawyers, folks, there are good clients and bad clients. And, you know, we're pretty much making the assumption that if you're coming out to these webinars, you're actively trying to level up your skill set, understand the legal pieces and some of the strategies that we've taken to raise money for your business. And again, we've got a weekly webinar, good hour series. So come out to some of the other ones where we touch on some of the other important topics. Um, but, you know, this is our big thank you for being part of our webinar community. Um, we want to educate Canadian entrepreneurs better because, you know, our old firm, the traditional profession, when it comes to lawyers as a whole, hasn't done a great job at making this information readily accessible and understandable. So thank you for coming out. Would love to see some more good lawyer pros um, joining us in the community. And we're going to end the day here with... Uh, We'll stick around a little longer, folks, but we're going to roll with uh, Q&A because I've got about eight questions here uh, to rip through with Josh before we wrap up today. Yeah, sounds good. Amazing. All right, Roger, um, thanks for your patience, my friend. I know you dropped this in early in the webinar. At what funding stage does having a CSR or sustainability initiative impact the valuation of a company? I mean, it's a great question. Uh, not really right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, but we're talking smart. about CSR, social business for good, ESG type things. Those are, uh, I think, factors and features that investors are looking for in the marketplace. Those are features and factors that uh, certainly more experienced investors at a, a different stage of capital raising are emphasizing in trying to build in their investment portfolios right now. It's, it's certainly part of the news and that's why uh, large companies are paying attention to this. I think this would have an impact at an early stage in your business. If this is really core and foundational to what you're building, if it's core and foundational to your story, you don't necessarily have to have a social good oriented business uh, in order to, you know, be committed to these principles. But I, you know, I think it has merit, but it's it's hard for me to assess, you know, in within your own network, how much that's going to resonate with the investors that you're talking to. Yeah. And it's one of those things where, you know, the, the impact assessment might be, you know, another sort of feather in your cap when you're talking to a certain subset of impact investors. Um, I think generally, you know, our whole ethos here is do good. You know, we're trying to help entrepreneurs succeed so they can build for good <laughs> day two of our summit. Um, it helps us in our storytelling, the fact that folks can see the positive sort of net impacts of what we're trying to do on both sides for entrepreneurs and startup founders, but also for these good lawyers that, you know, are tired of working in the big firm, just like we were and want to do something that feels more purposeful. So I would say that on the whole, building a socially positive business is is always good, but in today's sort of investor environment, definitely can give you a leg up um, and leaning into that is something that we've tried to do and, and will continue to do. I can respond to this next one here, Brett. I've got it open as well. Uh, question from, question here about crowdfunding and whether that's sort of a, a good source of capital for early stage investment rounds. I think crowdfunding is really interesting. Um, it's an exemption that exists uh, in certain jurisdictions in, in Canada, which basically allows companies to use a, an online platform to sell securities to the public. So this allows you to uh, cast your net wider than just your friends and family and close business associates, business associates and accredited investors. It allows uh, people that you maybe do not know in any of those kinds of capacities to invest in your business. But like this whole world of securities laws, there's consumer protections in place that make that mechanism restrictive and make that mechanism something that you have to be very careful to ensure you comply with. So there's rules around the types of reporting that you have to provide. There's rules around the amount of investment that you can take in from each individual in a crowdfunding capacity. One of the practical reasons why we have avoided crowdfunding we are on a roadmap here where we do want to approach uh, and work with venture capital. 
And one of the features that venture capital looks at in an investment um, in a portfolio company when they're looking at a startup is what does your cap table look like? How many shareholders do you have on there that we're sort of working this base with? And crowdfunding allows you to raise money from a wide net of shareholders. When you have a wide net of shareholders, that means you now have, let's say, 50 or 100 owners of your business, as well as your two co-founders. So that means there's lots of competing interests and personalities and stakeholders that you have to manage as part of your kind of annual compliance for your business and your decision making. That is not something that um, is a complete red flag or a complete um, a complete uh, game ender when you're dealing with uh, or deal breaker. Pardon me, what the heck, game ender, deal breaker when you're working with the venture Avengers capitalist. Game. Um, but it's something that you have to be cognizant of to uh, structure around. So there's a compliance piece and there's a practical piece that you got to think about when determining whether crowdfunding makes sense. What's the difference? This is from David earlier on as well. What is the difference between shareholder and founder agreement? Yeah, good question, David. Uh, essentially, not very much. Uh, it can be kind of used... Uh, interchangeably in a lot of cases. The idea sometimes of having your founder agreement separate from your shareholder agreement is maybe you have some um, unique rules that are only applying to the founders and not the other shareholders of the business. And rather than having a really complex shareholder agreement that you know your new passive investors, your friends and family uh, investors are going to want to try to understand you just kind of separate those two mechanisms from one another and and have them sit in two different places in a lot of contexts it maybe makes sense just to have you know the founder contingency planning provision sit in that shareholder agreement where your new passive investors will also be governed they'll just be treated slightly different than the co-founders yeah and like to me the founder agreement is really important for delineating those contingency plans what happens if someone leaves what are the expectations? Yeah, absolutely. And you you will still do that if you choose to do it in a shareholder agreement. It's just going to make that document uh, longer and a, and a bit more complicated. It's it's uh, it's fine to do it either way. Yeah. Um, Shara would love to answer this question on how, do, how does our offer differ from Legal Shield? Uh, Legal Shield is a, <laughs> a dirty word around here because we have been Good Lord Pro has been compared to that, but. Fundamentally, um, you know, Legal Shield, U.S. based company, very uh, old school in their marketing methods, to say the least. And you know, it, can it provide some value on some of the quick advice sessions? Absolutely. But what they don't do is they don't connect you with a trusted advisor, and they don't own the life cycle of all of your legal needs. So if you've ever used Legal Shield before, you will know that eventually the Legal Shield inclusion runs out. And then you're back to billable hours with a traditional offer. Good lawyer manages the entire life cycle. So you never fall back into billable hours ever. And our goal is to keep entrepreneurs, you know, working with us through platforms with these great lawyers across the country forever, because we're driving value. We're saving you money. We're delivering faster. And we're able to do that by making these lawyers lives a lot easier. So, um, at its core, the difference is good lawyer owns the entire life cycle of your legal needs when it comes to being a startup founder and entrepreneur, and Legal Shield doesn't. Question here from Patty. What IP, IP protection is available for code? This is a little bit outside of the um, you know direct focus on capital raising, but I did talk about how protecting the value of your business leads into a successful capital raise. So I'll address this quickly. Uh, there's a few different mechanisms here. Sometimes code can be um, protected by patent and you could maybe potentially register a patent to protect the unique software code that you might've created for your business. In other cases, uh, you might decide that the best way to protect that code is really by putting through some um, strict and diligent measures within your business to ensure that it stays secret. Um, so, 
one of the downsides of patent protection is that in order to get a patent, you have to tell the world what your invention is, all of the ins and outs and how it works and fits together. In exchange for telling the world about your new patent, your new invention, uh, you get a limited term monopoly to use and monetize that invention. If you decide to keep your code secret, that means you know the world doesn't know about it. They can't copy it and, and use it. Um, and you can try to keep that secret forever, but you have to be very careful, I, I guess, of how you're, uh, how you're protecting it to ensure that if it, uh, so that it doesn't leak out there because you have not protected a monopoly around it if it does leak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, in our experience too, the code's changing so fast that it'd be difficult to protect it in a meaningful way. Um, but if you're someone like Stripe or they've written nine lines of code that changed the world, then you're going to want to add a hell of a lot more protection around that. Um, I can take a swing at it uh, and try to answer two because they're both sort of touching on the same kind of general issue. Um, Charlotte, what's a reasonable percentage to give a consultant that we have on board with coaching in areas that we might not be so savvy in? A uh, couple hours a week, small percentage in exchange for ongoing out input. Uh, is this advised or just an hourly? And then on that same sort of note, uh, the question from Arius, uh, what's a good rule when you want to onboard a new co-founder by giving them some equity um, on that road to achieving more milestones? And the reason why to me those are similar is because they come at the basically the same question, which for me, I always ask myself, what value is this individual going to add to the mission, to the company? And if it's a couple hours a week from a critical advisor, then that could be some material value. If it's a co-founder joining with a skill set that you don't have, well, that's a lot of value. And then trying to assess that value in the context of the value of the business is where the magic happens. And, you know, a lot of founders have relied on safes, um, which is a really simplistic way of raising equity without pegging a valuation. But I was actually thinking about this when Josh was talking earlier. One of the challenges with that is it makes it harder to pinpoint equity incentives, which are you know intended to be provided to advisors and employees, co-founders, to get them on board for the long haul. So for us, it's always been this is the valuation of the company. This is what we've you know agreed with this new individual is the value add of their services. And we often bring that back to kind of a ballpark market rate because it's never going to be perfect, but that kind of can get you close. And then it's coming to terms with, with that individual scoping out what the expectations are. And, you know, we're getting better at that in the early days. It was a little too vague. And, you know, some of the advisors we had, I would have liked to get more out of, but we learn as we go and really scoping out what are the expectations? What is the value they're bringing to the company? what is a fair sort of market portion to, to give to that value. And then you cut a deal. And at the end of the day, you got to cut a deal. And I think my overarching kind of feeling on it is more, more helpful, smart, dedicated people on your rocket ship, the better. So um, I wouldn't lose an advisor because we are off 50 bucks in terms of like the hourly compensation they want in the form of equity. Um, it's really about trying to get that alignment on what is this person going to do for the company and how committed are they to the long term? Awesome. I think, Brett, we're at 110. I think maybe we should give people the back the rest of their day. If we didn't get to your questions, uh, tune in next time. We'll be back every Thursday. Every Thursday, folks. Every Thursday, we're back. Good hour. We're here noon calgary time and we'll do our best to get to those questions and share more tips and advice with you next time thank you everybody for coming out it's been a lot of fun it uh it's like riding a bike it's good to be back it's good to be back we missed you i missed you see ya